Thursday evening cruise here in Chelsea. We're on 24th Street. And, uh, well, we're going to go in and visit a show that I've been excited about since I heard about this uh, maybe two months ago. We're going to stroll in here to Fredericks and Fraser. And we're going to enjoy an exhibition by Thomas Troche. Thomas is uh, one of the few contemporary painters that I could actually honestly say was kind of a uh, cult figure. He's got a lot of uh, friends, admirers, people that appreciate his, what could I say, odd, eccentric aesthetic. gallery list starts here so I guess we'll start off taking a look at this piece this is the unknown masterpiece 2017 oil on canvas 23 by 39 David Reed a very well-known abstract painter that started to get some major attention I think he's got to show up or recently had to show up at Gagosian has said that uh, there is a group knowledge. There's a group of painters that all kind of hang together and know what's going on in the painting world. And this is not maybe recognized by the market or academia or the art historians. But these are all professionals that have been painting for years and uh, they know what the good stuff is. And uh, well, when I was Talking about Thomas's work, I think he is someone that actually does fit into that category of the, I don't know what you'd call it, the eccentric, uh, serious painter that has got some, some fans. It's titled The Native American Artist. Encaustic on panel. I first started uh, running into some of Thomas's work probably about 20 years ago, 18 years ago, and uh, actually wrote a review for the Brooklyn Rail about him maybe in the early aughts. It's titled Green Lagoon, Oil on Marble. I guess uh, if you're painting on marble, you don't have to worry about how heavy your paint is. And for those of you who do watch the 
the calm report. If you go back and check my uh, my little tour of the Armory show, Jeffrey Deitch had a little booth called, I think it was the Time Collapse Salon of Florine Stedheimer. This piece is titled Royal Visit 2013 and Costagon Panel. Well, this is interesting because uh, Thomas is employing more encaustic, which most of the work I've seen before has been pure oil. It's titled Tea and Sympathy. It's oil on canvas, 50 by 43. Jeffrey Deitch has kind of identified Thomas as one of the uh, people that is carrying on the legacy of the kind of eccentric painting that Florian Stedheimer was doing. My God, everybody started screaming all of a sudden. And, uh, well, just as a painter myself, I always love people that use a lot of paint. And I think the wonderful thing about Thomas is that not only is he uh, moving a lot of paint around and doing a lot of weird things with it and uh, taking the time and having the patience to build up these paintings in rather bizarre ways, but he also has been creating strange narrative stories that go along with the paintings and this is this is one of his favorite characters kind of the uh, nature boy blonde artist who has somehow come into contact with the the wealthy and glamorous artist supporting matron It's titled, Call from the Coast. I would also say that probably some of these paintings have taken Thomas many years to, uh, to build up. Uh, another thing I'm noticing is that he's kind of expanded his his scale a little bit. I know when I officially, uh, when I initially started seeing his work, maybe in the mid late 90s, he was doing a lot of fairly large pieces, and then uh, recently a lot of the work was more what I would consider classic easel size, so maybe up to three and a half feet, something like that. And so. Uh, it's nice to see some of these pieces where he stretched out a little more. This is titled The Lady, the Artist, and the Octopus. No, there is a, uh, a wonderful contrast to various ways of applying paint. We've got thin washes, we've got the thick little brush gooby things, we've got the dripping, we've got various mediums and resin things. I guess what I would say is that I am a fan of the, uh, the human hand. The, the paw is coming in and working things. That's one of the reasons why I always enjoy um, looking at the edge of paintings. That's where you really uh, get a chance to see where the, the obsession, the, uh, the handwork meets the real world. This is titled The Protégé. canvas yeah there is uh, scumbling in here and uh, scraping and dripping and things that are just
just uh, wonderful. Also, Thomas has got a very uh, unique palette. I don't know, these things look like they've been uh, hanging around the studio and uh, collecting all kinds of debris for years. This is titled Maytime in Mayfair. I'm not sure, but I think that his last show might have had some pieces that were dealing with the Mayfair theme somehow. Uh, regarding Florine Stedheimer, she was a wonderful, eccentric. New York painter who was involved with uh, early modernism, was a friend of Marcel Duchamp, and hung out at the Ahrensburg Salon. Uh, I think she died in maybe the mid-40s, late-40s, and most of her work was donated to a couple of institutions, and I think the Metropolitan got some of them, and at some point, Henry Geldzahler um, made a point of dragging Andy Warhol down into their storage racks and pulling out some Stedheimer paintings, and uh, Andy was very impressed. And, uh, well, there is a kind of uh, wonderful, rich tradition of New York Kitsch, I don't know, Kitsch Camp, somewhere floating in between those realms. Well, this is interesting back here because it's like a little mini retrospective. We've got uh, a series of pieces from the late 90s. titled Dorothy Rogers Decorating Lesson Number 14 from 1993, oil on canvas, 84 by 70 inches, so this is about 7 by 6 feet, and well you can sort of get an idea of the development of Thomas's work here, we've got some text, finally after two or three years of I work and footwork, I honestly came to see what some of the enthusiasm was about. So I would say that that kind of relates to uh, maybe Warhol and uh, Lichtenstein's comic book works. But even here, there's a great uh, kind of brutal urgency and uh, an obsessive reworking and scraping and going back in and dragging. It's titled Japanese Lesson. 1993 to 68 by 84. Well, I am a painter that always believes in uh, using contrasts, and one of the things about this that is attractive for me is you can see that there are big, large sections of the canvas that are basically just white flat oil paint, and then you've got these sections, and it looks like Thomas just literally slung paint around. Meanwhile, that's all played off with areas of text, and, well, 
is appropriate, so he's got uh, little confections here, and that almost looks like the kind of frosting that you would get squeezing it out of a confectioner's tube, and, and the paint makes it very self-referential. He's got some crackle in there. One of the odd features about the early work, too, is the the big eyes. I don't know whether that was a reference to the uh, Keen Kids or Japanese anime. This is the Japanese lesson, so maybe that that's where that comes from. Dorothy Rogers decorating lesson 1996, 74 by 60. So this is a lot thinner, but even so, there's still a lot of weird paint things happening. We've got puckering, dripping, clotting, smushing, staining, erasing. And at this point, we've even got a little crackle. Also, uh, it's a great, uh, almost intuitive palette. It's titled Music Comedy Medley. 1996, 74 by 60. Well, just look at the weird stuff going on here. Yeah, I wonder how he gets these little uh, swizzles of paint there. Some of this does look like it's uh, flung. So that's great. We've got uh, the glamorous lady in her golden dress holding a basket full of goodies and a purse with other juicy things popping out. We've got the... Uh, it's like a silver sculpture. And... It, this actually looks like some of the paintings out in the front room. This is our last piece, music comedy medley. And uh, in this one, uh, Thomas has gotten a little more involved with the text. He's got various typefaces. Which land is dreamier? Arcadia or Bohemia? My great grandmother's. Oh, uh, 74 by 60 inches. Uh, yeah, here he's almost structured the shape of this vase using impasto like a sculptural element. Nice shot of color there. This is good. We got something splashing here down in the corner. Well, I can just say that it probably takes years for these to dry. <laughs> Maybe many years. <laughs> It's a swell planet if you take time to scan it and it all belongs to you. You know, I'm looking at some of the uh, textural builds-ups and uh, 
his patterning and uh, it actually recalls some of Terry Winter's early groundbreaking work and I like the uh, the pencil lines that are coming through well we've uh, caught up with Thomas Congratulations. I was just, I was looking through my archives and I noticed that I covered a show you did here, maybe it was your last show, 2009. And it's great to see you back. Um, these paintings here in the back are... Oh, this is these are earlier. Right, this is about 20 years ago. Yeah, and then I had, it was just simply the matter of having more space. I had a great big studio. So... So it's to make bigger if you've got a bigger space, the paintings get bigger. If, the, if you've got a smaller space, the paintings get smaller. And yes. it's, that's a very practical way to approach it. Also, I was wondering, you know, uh, in the press release, it talks about you um, living and working in New York and then out in California. Where did you, where did you work when you were, I mean, who, did you study here in New York? Or were you part I, of the East Village scene or any of that stuff? I wasn't in the East Village scene, but um, I studied here at the studio school. Oh, the studio school, okay, good, ago. yes. We got a lot of friends to study at the studio school. The other thing I was wondering about is the narratives. You know, you've got the, uh, what I was calling kind of the nature boy artist, the blonde haired guy that's kind of running around and then there's the, the matronly lady that's sort of floating in out. Where does that come from? They, they are people that, there were people, when, mostly from when I was in California. Real people. Oh, well, uh, sort of composite, but they're like uh, the kinds of people that I would have met out there when I lived out there. Really? <laughs> Did you surf when you were out there? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I went to the beach. Okay. 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 Um, the other thing, and I'll kind of wrap up with this, is um, your use of text. Now, in these older pieces, you've got text in there, you've got dialogue, it's kind of like uh, cartoon bubbles, but at some point you kind of reduced the text or maybe got away from that text. Uh, what, what's your ideas and your, the way you're thinking about text? Well, again, I think it was just simply that, you know, I have so much space, and the canvas is very big, so I have room to do that. I would probably do it again if I could, but on, in a small painting, it's hard. Yes, but is it also, is the narrative important for you and sort of maybe oh, filling in parts of the narrative? It doesn't seem to have changed. The new paintings, they don't have the text, but they have the same subject matter. Yes. Same kind of feel to them. I mean, okay. Well, Thomas, you got a lot of fans out there, and I'm one of them. It's always nice to see you working. Congratulations. And good luck with the show. Oh, thanks so much. Nice to see you. Thank you. <laughs> this has been James Calm reporting on Thomas Troche, Paintings New and Old, here at Fredericks and Fryser, 536 West 24th Street in Chelsea. And join me, folks. Thank you, Kate. Oh, that was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, my name's Curtis. Curtis. Curtis August. Curtis August. That was great, Curtis. Thank you. Thank you.